In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is risen. Truly is. We could do better than that. Christ is risen. Truly is. There we go. In the weeks that led up to Holy Week and through Holy Week, I spent a lot of time reflecting with you on the spiritual progress that comes to us in some ways, uh, in no other way, throughout the rest of the church year as it does come to us during Lent, into Holy Week, and then through to Pascha. Somebody remarked recently that there's enough grace in Holy Week alone to last us an entire year. And so because of all of the important progress that we make spiritually, I talked a lot about how we need to work on holding on to that once we got to and then past Pascha into back to our normal life. And hopefully you notice at least some things that you grew through that process, through the process of your efforts at prayer and fasting and almsgiving during the Great Lent, through the attention to the life and the works of Christ that we witnessed during Holy Week, and then, of course, that explosion of joy that comes to us at Pascha. Hopefully, you were able to see some growth and change. Now, if you don't see it, it doesn't mean, by the way, it's not there. In fact, we're not really supposed to track our progress so much as just do what we need to do. But hopefully, you notice that there's at least some growth. And if you don't notice it, uh, hopefully it's there. And I saw a quote, this was sent out from Father Anthony at St. George to his parishioners, and it was such a, a beautiful quote I wanted to share with you this morning. It's from St. Paisios, who was a saint in our modern day, and he writes, Let us not expect the spiritual spring if we don't first pass through the spiritual winter, during which the spiritual vermin die, only after, only after the spiritual winter will the divine blossom within us. The beautiful statement about how all of that effort in Lent and Holy Week was so important for us to be able to celebrate Pascha, not just as a joyous commemoration, but as a change of life that the church has always been guiding us to. If we had growth, it wasn't because we did the same old things, because we pushed ourselves. And these days of uh, easy comfort and easy luxury for all of us make it harder for us to push ourselves. Think about, some of you remember days before the remote control. Some of you remember having to get up and turn the dial on the TV. Imagine life today if we had to get up and turn through those 455 channels. So we're a little bit spoiled. And because we're so spoiled, it's hard for us to put out the effort that we need to make, and especially to push ourselves in our spiritual growth. But pushing ourselves is what we need to do. I was joking with Vicki when we were on our, our cruise. We took a cruise. We just got back uh, yesterday. Enjoyed a wonderful celebration of our coming anniversary. The anniversary is not for another month, but there was a gap in the schedule to come, and there was a good... Uh, uh, a moment to take some time away. And so we were on that beautiful cruise ship on the beautiful Atlantic, visiting all these wonderful, gorgeous islands of the Caribbean. And on the cruise ship was a, a ropes course. It was on the top deck, which was itself 15 decks above the ocean. And then you went up above that. And I kept teasing Vicky, come on, aren't you going to the ropes course? And she was smart enough to say no. And I was dumb enough to say, well, I'm going to go up and do it. So I climb the ladder and they hook me in and I'm walking across, you know, ropes and these different things. And I look down and I'm looking down two black dude decks below me to the, what will be ground level before, beneath where I'm walking. And there's a guy about my age looking at me, just shaking his head. <laughs> I said, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but I had to push myself and it's a good thing for us to do that. If we don't push ourselves, we don't grow. And Lent and Holy Week was the pushing ourselves that we need. Well, today in the church, we are given really good examples of people who push themselves. And I want to focus on one particular quality that are shown in what we 
celebrate today, and that is the quality of courage. We heard in the gospel reading that Joseph, who was a respected member of the council, had to take courage and go to Pilate. Now, what did he need courage for? First of all, we already just heard he was a respected member of the council, and he's going to ask the body of somebody who just died by capital punishment. All of the powers of the day in Jesus' time conspired against him, the religious leaders and the civil leaders. And now here's Joseph, who has the respect of the council, putting all that at risk to go to Pilate and publicly ask for the body of Jesus so he can give it burial. That's taking courage. And Joseph, along with Nicodemus, who we also commemorate today, took courage to went to ask for the body of Jesus. But our examples of courage don't end there. Today is known uh, more, more uh, openly as Myrrh Bearing Women Sunday. For once, the women get main building and the men get the second building. It's a good thing. It doesn't happen often enough. But on this Sunday, the Myrrh Bearing Women, we commemorate them taking courage. Here they were getting up in the middle of the night, carrying what the scripture tells us about a hundred pounds of ointment. And they're walking in the middle of the night, which in many places is not a safe time to be out walking. And they're walking alone. And they're going to the tomb to go to prepare Jesus' body for final burial. Remember, they had to hurriedly take him down from the cross, wrap him quickly, put him in the tomb before the Sabbath day would come with the setting of sun on that great and holy Friday. So here the woman come back on the first day of the week, early in the morning before dawn, before the sun has come up, also going out publicly to go and prepare the body of Jesus. That took great courage to make that public statement. But also they went not even knowing how they were going to do it. They're literally on their way to the tomb when they start to discuss among themselves who's going to roll away the stone. It was a big stone rolled across the door of the tomb. And they were so courageous to go, they hadn't even thought about how they were going to get it done. What great examples of courage they are for us also. Think of the courage it took both for Joseph and Nicodemus and the women to publicly do this. Think back to just a few nights before when even Peter, the chief among the disciples, denies Jesus not once but three times. I don't know the man. And there's the murmuring woman publicly by going to anoint Jesus' body saying, we're with him. They literally put their lives on the line to go to prepare Jesus for his final burial. That's courage. My brothers and sisters, courage is something that we all need. And it's too easy for us to write off the courage of the saints, Nicodemus, Joseph, and the murdering woman, and say, well, they're saints. And as I said to you and will continue to say to you, we don't say that they're saints to excuse us because of the difference. When we look at their icons, we say, that's who we should be. They set the standard for us. They don't say for us that we're different. They claim to us how we should be different. And in this case, to be like them in their courage. And we live in a time when perhaps courage fails us because of our life of ease. Maybe we're not, we haven't built up that inner strength of courage. But we need it. We need it. So today what I want to say to you is to take courage. But I'm not just going to say it to you. It's important that we do it. But I want to give you three ways that we can indeed take courage. Because just deciding to do it isn't enough. We can decide. But if we don't do what it needs, what we need to do to get to that place of being able to take courage more, then perhaps we're not going to do it as often as we need to. I made it a little bit easier for you. There are going to be three Fs. And the first one, if you haven't guessed already, is going to be faith. If we're going to take courage, we have to have faith. And what's faith? Faith is not the assurance that we often want. We'll say to ourselves, 
well, if I have faith, if I could just be convinced, then I'm going to believe. Faith is when we're not convinced, or at least not completely. Faith is when we're still a little bit afraid, or still a little unsure, and we decide that anyway, we're going to put our trust. Anytime you hear the word faith, I want you to hear the word trust. To have faith is to trust. And how are we going to take courage if we don't trust God? And how are we going to trust him unless we don't try? So we all have these seeds of faith, these little bit of, of trust in God. But we heard the gospel just a few weeks ago in that beautiful prayer of the man who wanted his son to be healed. And Jesus says, do you believe I can do this? And the man says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Because we have both. We have our faith. We have our lack of faith. And if we're going to be able to take courage, we need to build up our faith. And that means we're going to do it in the face of fear. We're going to do it in the face of having risk. If there's no risk, we don't need faith. Faith is what we need, especially when there is risk. So to practice our trust in God, to build on those little drops of faith that we do have and make them bigger, is one of the ways that we're going to be able to take courage. That's the first one, is faith. The second one is fidelity. Fidelity, being faithful. Faithful to whom? Faithful to the ones that we love. How are we going to take more courage and have more faith in Christ if we don't attempt to be faithful to him in that sense of fidelity, to be true to him because we love him? Not just because it's easy, not just because we feel comfortable, not even just because we have faith. St. Paul says three things live on, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. If we're going to take courage in our lives, we're going to have to grow in our fidelity to Christ as the one we love. Because we love him, then we take courage. When Vicky and I uh, got off the ship, we got off in New York. We spent a little, about a day and a half in New York. And just yesterday morning, about this time, 24 hours ago, we were touring the memorial and the museum of September 11th. And if you go to New York, I'm going to encourage you to make the effort to go and spend several hours in that beautiful, moving memorial. It's an important thing that we don't forget what happened to our fellow people in our country, our own history, but also it's important that we don't forget the examples of courage. So many examples of courage were on display in that sacred space. We sat in one little gallery, and it was on the the Flight 93, the flight that crashed not too far actually from the Antiochian village in Pennsylvania. And as part of the display, we got to hear the voice recordings of phone calls that people on the plane were making to loved ones. And one particular struck me very deeply. It was a flight attendant. She's in the back of the plane. The plane has been hijacked. And they know that other planes have now already been crashed into the World Trade Center. And they're wondering what their fate is going to be. And the plane is so low, she actually gets a cell phone signal and she calls her husband, who sadly wasn't able to to pick up the phone. So he got the voice recording of the message, thankfully now kept intact for all of history. And when I tell you that you can hear a smile on her face, I'm not exaggerating. This is a woman calling from a plane that she is on, hijacked, knowing this may be her final moments. And what is she doing in faithfulness to the one that she loves, her husband? She's talking with a cheer in her voice. I won't quote it for you, but it's, Hi, honey. I'm okay. As she tries to convey calmness to him, knowing that when he hears this, it may be a very different world for him. Her faithfulness to the one she loved caused her to put her own difficulties aside and put a smile into her voice for her husband. That's courageous, but it's a courage born from love and faithfulness to the one that she loved. 
So we have faith and we have fidelity to the ones that we love. And if we're going to take courage for God, it's because we have faithfulness to him. Fidelity to him because we love him, because we know what he's done for us. St. John, the beloved apostle, writes in his fourth, fourth chapter of his first letter. If you haven't read 1 John 4 in a while, go home and read 1 John chapter 4. Incredible chapter, every verse. But he says in that fourth chapter of that letter, perfect love casts out fear. One of the reasons that we find such a, a, an absence of courage in our lives is we don't love enough. And sometimes we don't love enough because we don't feel like it. Well, fidelity to the ones we love doesn't require a feeling. It just requires a decision. I will be faithful to the one I love. And if we love Christ, we're faithful to him in spite of our fears. And that's one of the ways that we take courage. And the third F is actually fear itself. My brothers and sisters, we're not going to eradicate fear from our lives. What we can hope to do is work to put it in its proper place, which is there, but small. How many of us have let our fears run rampant in our lives, growing to degrees we don't even recognize where they end? That's, where, that's what anxiety is. Fear is knowing what we're afraid of to a certain point. Anxiety continues where we don't even know what's beyond that point. We don't even know. We can't even name what we're afraid of. But we're afraid. So putting our fear into perspective is the third of the F's of ways that we take courage. And here we are on the second Sunday after Pascha, still trying to muster up that Paschal joy to proclaim proudly and strongly that Christ is risen. But that changes everything. I was able to finally attend Charlie's class this morning because Charlie is at his son's graduation, so I actually sat in to be the substitute teacher. Students all behave, don't worry, even though I was a substitute, they behave pretty well. But we talked about how the rising of Christ changed everything. These murmuring women went to the tomb not with a lot of hope in his resurrection. They're going with the ointments to anoint his body for final and lasting burial. And imagine going from that horror, the one they had seen raise people from the dead, now a victim of death, death itself, and then they go and the tomb is empty. And they have the joy of the resurrection proclaimed to them. My brothers and sisters, that's the context for all of our fears. Whether it's a fear of death itself, which fuels so much of all of our other fears, we don't always connect the dots, but the dots are always there. But whatever it is we're afraid of, Pascha changes it. What is left the same it was before when we go and experience the resurrection of Christ? Nothing. I want to read for you one of the hymns that we sing. We sing it already uh, today. It is the day of resurrection. Let us be radiant for the festival. And let us embrace one another. Let us say, O oh, brethren, even to those that hate us. Talk about change. Going up to somebody, I don't know if any of you have people that hate you, but if you do, to go up and say to them, You're my brother, you're my sister. And let us forgive all things on the resurrection. And let us cry, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Brothers and sisters, Pascha changes everything. Whatever fear we had before, if it hasn't changed because of Pascha, we haven't thought about it enough. And we haven't connected our fear on the one hand with the joy of the resurrection, bringing them together. We have to do that. We have to take all the things we're afraid of and connect them up with the joy of the resurrection. And they may not go away, but they come back down to size. They come back down into perspective. So I hope we will all do what the myrrh-bearing women show us today, what Joseph and Nicodemus show us today, and that is to take courage. 
I gave you three ways to do it, three things, that, three steps we can take to grow courage in our life. Without that, when we don't take courage, fear grows. It's not static. It's not going to stay. It's going to grow and grow and grow. We can push it back and push back that wall of fear with the power of courage and courage that comes from our faith, our faith in Christ, our fidelity to him because we love him, and by letting his conquering of death bring back fear back into his proper perspective. So let's take courage. Let's take courage in our God who took courage for us and endured all he did to bring us to a new life. All these things that he did, all the things that Murray women do, all give us examples of things that we can do. And when we do that, we find ourselves right where they found themselves. Face to face with every sorrow and joy being turned and life being turned into joy. At three little words, I want to hear you respond very powerfully. Christ is risen. Christ is risen.